th there was a, a competition some while ago, I can't remember how long ago, that amongst mathematic mathematicians, they decided well, what's the minimum number of shapes that, it will that are, you can tile an infinite floor with? This is how they amuse themselves, I think. And, uh, and at one point, and I, I, will, I know I'll get the details wrong, but I think it was a, a, a Chinese chap had it down to several thousand shapes. With it was several a, student, a student of his, yes. Right, several thousand yeah, yeah. shapes. He could prove that you could tile an infinite space with these, this set number of tiles, and the pattern would never repeat. So it's not like a square tile. And then Roger got involved because he thought, ooh, that sounds interesting. Would anyone like to guess how many shapes Roger has got it down to? Just shout out. Say no, <laughs> yes, and everyone else went, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, it, got, it walked its way down. I think it got down to about 100 by Robert Berger, who had the number right. originally. And then it got down to, kept working its way down to, till it got down to six. Right. And I was aware of that six. I had another way of doing it with six, you see. But when I heard about that, and I, was told that the chap who did this liked to find the smallest number. So I said, well, I can do it with five. <laughs> because I could glue two of my bits together. Well, it wasn't quite like that. But, but then I fiddled around, and I got it down to two. <laughs> <coughs> and that was the end of that competition. <laughs> <laughs> but the interesting thing about it is, you think, well, that's an interesting pastime. But actually, this work on, on aperiodic tiling has tremendous things to say about the limits of logic and the way that consciousness might work. And, and it's one of the things that's most interesting about the work is that <coughs> Roger goes off in all these different directions, but uh, are, you are you thinking, ah, oh, this will give me another avenue back to this? Because they, your work has been tremendously varied, but, but it does sort of double back to things that you've always been preoccupied, like the limits of logic. I don't know whether I can answer that question. I don't know. I just do what interests me mainly. And the logic thing, I had a lot of conversations when I was an undergraduate with Ian Percival. We used to talk about, well, a lot of other things, but logic was certainly one of the things we talked about. And I was very worried by this thing called Gödel's theorem <laughs> because it seemed to show that there were things in mathematics you couldn't prove. And then when I went to Cambridge as a graduate student, and I went to three lecture courses which were nothing to do with my actual work. <laughs> One was by Herman Bondi on, on general relativity in, in cosmology. One was by Paul Dirac, famous quantum mechanics, one of the founders of quantum mechanics. And uh, he, he gave, um, they were both beautiful sort, sets of lectures in a completely different way. And then I went to another course, which was a course by a man called Steen on mathematical logic, because I was interested in this Gödel question. And I learned about Turing machines, those are the general, well, the basis of modern computers, if you like, Turing machines, and uh, I learned about Gödel's theorem. And I learned, to my relief, that it was not that Gödel showed that there are things you couldn't prove. It's just that if you had a particular set of rules that you follow, and that these rules are things you could put on a computer to check whether they've done, been done right, then those rules, you can find some other example. Well, these rules prove things about numbers, you see, and infinite things. There you are, you see. <laughs> <laughs> infinite things about numbers, um, such as, for example, um, every number is the sum of four square numbers, which is proved by Lagrange, quite a hard theorem. Or that every even number greater than two is the sum of two prime numbers. That's still unproved. Things of that sort, you see. These are s statements about the infinite. Now the question is, you've got certain rules about how you prove things. And if you fix those rules, and if you believe they only give you truths, what Gödel does, he comes along and says, well, look, here's a statement of just the same kind, but what you can see, by virtue of understanding what the statement means, that you cannot prove it using those rules, if you trust those rules to only give you truths. So if you're using the rules, only give you true things. Here's another thing, which you can see is true by virtue of your knowledge that the rules only give you true things, but you cannot prove it using the rules. I mean, so it's twists of logic there. So you can, you, you can tell it's true by knew, knowing that the rules only give you truths, but you can't use it 
prove it using the rules. Yes. And I found that stunning, you see. It's yes. Just, just absolutely stunning. I mean, in, in case that's puzzling, that, that's the, <laughs> the deep mathematical version of this statement is false. Yes, but yes, that's... Uh, you all <laughs> understood it because you understand the rules yes. of, of the English language, but you can't decide whether what I said is true or not. Yes, it has to be... And not it's not because I didn't say it <laughs> properly or that you didn't understand it properly, and that's a trivial version, uh, and, and Gödel... Yes, but what Gödel really says, this statement is not provable by those rules. Yes, and but, that's, but, that's but what proved it. it. Yeah. And, and is it, would you agree that it basically made him the most unpopular logician ever? Well, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, well, uh, I'd say that if you, uh, he, he taught at the not. University of Vienna, and if you go to the courtyard, the university there, big, huge building, and they have a very proudly a bust in, in marble, every single famous professor, or every professor who, who taught there, going back several centuries, except for Kurt Gödel. Well, that's a big mistake. <laughs> yes. Oh, gosh. So, I don't so think yeah. they made him, no. No, he opened up all sorts of things, he opened up huge areas of mathematics, no. Yes, but he does pull the rug out from under the pretension <laughs> yes, that you will true. have a formal yes. system yes. which, once you've got it, will be able to give you the correct answer to any question you give it, which is the, the, the still the founding belief that we'll be able to create an AI, and when we do, it'll give us the answer to everything. Yeah, Gödel rather clearly said, no, it won't. <laughs> well, I, I mean, yeah, that's where it leads you. I mean, it shows you... That's the way it led me, you see. Yes. It but that's made you quite unpopular, too. I have no idea. Well, <laughs> people disagree with me. That's yes, true. Yes, they do. <laughs> I don't know. Well, they quite, a few, quite a few bought my book, The Empress of the <laughs> So it can't be just unpopularity that did Well, work. no, but I just spent, I spent <laughs> several months interviewing lots and lots of the, the techie boys who are doing the AI revolution. Oh, and if I mention oh, yeah, your yeah. name, they go, <laughs> Yes, well, that's, you see, it does show that there is something different going on in, I mean, this is what I learned from Steen's course. It may not have been quite how he put it, but, but there is something going on in human understanding which is not computational. That it's different from what a computer does. So, okay, when people call it artificial intelligence, I think that's a misnomer. What artificial should it be? cleverness, perhaps. Right. But AC stands for uh, an alternating current, so you couldn't say uh, <laughs> that wouldn't work, you see. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI-TV.